introduce ourselves? Is that how this works? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Deborah Crank Lewis. I'm the history teacher here, a history teacher, not the only one, at uh, St. Charles Community College. And my portion of uh, this presentation on Missouri at 200 is in regard to the Missouri Compromise. So it actually starts a tiny little bit before the bicentennial moment for our state because it was rather a torturous path to get to that 200 year moment uh, of actually joining the Union. So this uh, event of Missouri statehood begins to unfold during the administration of James Monroe. And Monroe's uh, election enter, or ushers in the era of, of uh, good feeling. But it doesn't last very long because we sort of make a mess of that in our attempt to become a state. And I think it begins to demonstrate the regional problems that really were there from the beginning. I think you can look at the, the founding of the colonies as the moment when regionalism begins to creep into the conversation and it's just going to get worse and worse as time goes on. So this map is just giving you a little glimpse. Um, it does indicate our state, but it's showing you the division between free states and slave states, and that's part of the controversy of our state coming into the Union. Prior to Missouri's application, the pattern that had started, uh, even with the colonies becoming states, was that you would get a free state and a slave state. And it, that pattern had gone back and forth um, with some regularity. There had been a couple of little hiccups in it, but usually a slave state and a free state. So by the time we get to 1818, when Missouri makes its application, the assumption was the even part of it meant Missouri would come in as a slave state. And there really wasn't an expectation that things would work differently. But that's not exactly how it worked out. A slave state did come in. Just to give you an idea of the uh, population, we were functioning under a pattern of um, territorial status towards statehood that had occurred or had been created during the time of the Northwest Ordinances of 1785 and 1787. And the number that had been set was 60,000. So when a state reached 60,000 in its population, that's when it could apply for statehood. So you can see on this chart the counties that made up Missouri's territory at that moment and the number of people living in those counties, both free whites and the enslaved. And then at the bottom, you can see the total. And we had just gone a little bit past the 60,000 mark. Now, at the time, politicians made the assertion that it was over 100,000 people, but it certainly was not over 100,000 people. And this is giving you a glimpse of, at St. Charles. Uh, St. Charles had uh, not the biggest percentage of slaves, but it was a number of some significance, about 20 percent, almost 21 percent of the population of St. Charles County. Uh, was classified as enslaved. That number is bigger in terms of the actual numbers over to the west, which will become the core of Little Dixie in our state. <coughs> so, of course, Henry Clay, as Secretary of, or excuse me, as Speaker of the House, is the man who steps up to a rather difficult plate, but he's the perfect person to do it because there are very few people as wily as Henry Clay, and he was a consummate politician, uh, a good statesman when he needed to be, but a consummate politician. And Missouri's making its efforts to be heard in its request for statehood several different times. Um, as you can see, it's more than once. And it just kept coming. But Congress refused to take up the any action. Now, there was an earlier attempt, and this was a petition that circulated within the state in 1817, but we hadn't quite hit our population number just yet. So Missouri was quite anxious to make its uh, way into the Union. This is the congressional record on January the 8th, 1818, indicating that finally the Congress has taken up the issue of Missouri's request for statehood. But what exactly does that mean? 
Uh, this is giving you a look at the space within the territory that had once been the Louisiana Territory. When Louisiana became a state, it became the Missouri Territory. And when the state of Missouri was hoping to take shape, they were trying to grab as much space as they possibly could, which included something called the Arkansas County. Today we know it as the state of Arkansas, but Missouri thought, well, we should have that as well. But this is what they actually had planned for in terms of the state itself. So it looks a little bit different than our state looks today and is significantly bigger. It took in part of Iowa, it took in part of Kansas, and some of Nebraska, and a little bit of Oklahoma, and a portion of northern Arkansas. So uh, they had to be uh, disabused of that land grab. At about the time that Missouri makes its application, there was an anti-slavery convention. <clears throat> and the people that met to denounce the terrible practice of enslaving other human beings called for a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution to eliminate slavery. And one of the first people in Congress to pick up on that is this man, Arthur Livermore, who was a, a representative from the state of New Hampshire. But he represents something known as the restrictionists, people who wanted to restrict slavery to not allow it to come into the territories. And he was by no means the only one. He's just one of the first voices. Rufus King of New York is really the, the largest voice. And he's one of the few founders still left in government. He was a senator from the state of New York. He had signed the Constitution. And he, he's really got two things at work. One, he doesn't want to see slavery expanded. So we would refer to him as a restrictionist. But the other thing is that King very much resents Southern, um, how shall I put it, the fact that the South had an unfair advantage in Congress through the Three-Fifths Clause. The South's representation was skewed because they were able to count a portion of their slave population in order to have more representatives. Their lo lower overall population that was given to them, sort of like a way of buying their vote for ratification of the Constitution. Someone a little closer to home, because even though Missouri does apply as a slave state, there are restrictionists here in the state, and this is one of them, Edward Bates, who served as Missouri's first attorney general. You may know him later as a member of Lincoln's cabinet, but he too was a restrictionist. James Talmadge, a representative from New York, is also a restrictionist. They want to see slavery stopped, no more slavery into any new territory. So. Talmadge is the one that really throws a wrench into what had been up to this point a relatively simple process for a state to come into the Union. This map is showing you Missouri just prior to statehood uh, in the early, very early, probably about 1816, 1817, somewhere in there. So what Talmadge did was when Missouri's request came to Congress, Congress then has to give its approval for an enabling act to allow a state to create a state government and to form a state constitution. So Talmadge put two amendments. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as one amendment, sometimes two amendments. But he created what came to be known as the Talmadge Amendments. And you see them here. That no further introduction of slavery shall be tolerated. No new slaves could come into the state. So there were already slaves in the state. The state was making an application, or the territory was making an application to come in as a slave state. Slavery had been here since the beginning, since the time of the Chotos, when it was a French territory, when it was a Spanish territory. Slavery had been here, but it was growing. One aspect of that is the fact that the Northwest Ordinances prohibit slavery north of the Ohio River. Don't give the northern states there too much credit because those states in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin figured out ways around that law. And they would call it indentured servitude and bring slaves in anyways, even though they were referred to as free states. <coughs> the other amendment is that any slave born in Missouri at the moment of statehood, that any slave born once we had entered the Union, upon reaching the age of 25 would be set free. 
both of those things are going to see what comes to be known as gradual emancipation. Slavery would eventually fall by the wayside. So it would be here, Missouri would come in as a slave state, but it would be restricted. Southerners went berserk in Congress. How dare anybody from the North address this institution and their, their respective states and economies? It's not to say that there weren't some Southerners and who were slaveholders who thought slavery shouldn't go away. There were some. They obviously didn't work very hard at it, and they seemed to have no problem putting the money in their pockets that slavery brought them. But there were some who wanted to address it and did want to see it eventually fall by the wayside. Thomas Jefferson was one of those individuals. But that's not going to happen right away, and this is simply going to enrage the South. I'm not saying Talmadge did the wrong thing. I'm saying it might make the job a little bit harder. So what this creates is known as the Missouri Crisis. What do we do now? How are we supposed to proceed with the question of statehood? Will we become a state or not? And the people of Missouri were not happy about it. So the question on the surface is relatively simple. Does Congress possess the authority to acquire a state to be different? All of a sudden, it's different now. Every state has come into the Union. Nobody's blanked an eye. And now all of a sudden, we're saying, well, in the case of Missouri, we want to restrict it. Okay, that's fine, but you can see that this would cause a crisis. And immediately, the people of Missouri were upset because they thought, why the holdup for us? Nobody's ever said this to any other slave state that's come into the Union. But of course, you realize there's more to it than the, just that question. It's an important question. The other aspect of this is, what about the institution of slavery? So you're really looking at the regional crisis coming into play in this picture that is, that is unfolding, and you're also looking at the issue of slavery itself. So the anti-slavery or the abolitionist voice is kind of beginning to get a little tiny bit louder. <clears throat> Another aspect to this, and this one might not be quite as apparent, is that some people are looking at these events of Missouri's complex entrance into the Union as a very political move on the part of the Federalists. That it may be the Federalists are trying to make a comeback, and what they want to do is reestablish a more federal system. The Jeffersonian Republic, Democratic Republicans had held sway. Jefferson had swept into the White House, and so had the the people who followed him in terms of Madison and Monroe. The Federalist Party was just about gone. Of course, they kind of shot themselves in the foot with that Hartford Convention thing during the War of 1812. But now they're trying to kind of resurrect their movement. At least that's how it appears to some. So of course, as they say, the plot thickens. The state that came in was not Missouri. It was Alabama. And Alabama came in as a slave state, and they just turned the page, and Alabama was in. That was that. There was no controversy. There was nothing being said. So now it's even, 11-11. Now what are we going to do? It's got to remain even. The South knows that if they lose any kind of leverage in the Senate, they're dead, because it's the leverage in the Senate that's going to help them prevent any kind of legislation that's unfriendly to slavery and I suppose on a, in a larger way to states' rights. So that you know, even slave state, free state thing has to be maintained as long as possible. It's only going to last a short amount of time. Talmadge has now left of the restrictionist cause, and that person is John W. Taylor, also from New York. So Taylor puts forward another amendment or another suggestion about Missouri's application and that is to let Missouri in as a slave state and Maine is an, in as a free state. That way the balance will be maintained. At first, that seemed like a solution. But then in the midst of the conversation about what Taylor was offering, and of course Clay is part of this, and Clay is feverishly working behind the scenes to arm twist and glad hand anybody he has to to get this done, Jesse Thomas from the state of Illinois, Senator Jesse Thomas introduces another amendment to Missouri's application. 
So the Thomas Amendment is another form of restrictionist legislation. In the Thomas Amendment, the state of Missouri would be allowed to enter the Union, but there would be no other slavery allowed in the rest of the territory. If our boundary had been as the original map I showed you, uh, if it had remained that, it wouldn't have been possible. Because you'll notice, not all of Missouri is above the 3630 parallel. That green line indicates most of Missouri's southern boundary, but not all of it. The boot hill lies below it. So Missouri could come in as a slave state with the Thomas Amendment as long as all of the state wasn't above that line. So we've got the boot hill for more than one reason. Could the Thomas Amendment be considered legal? It was highly irregular for a amendment like that to be attached and then suddenly go back for a vote. But I discovered uh, in terms of looking at politics, almost anything is possible. <coughs> so the way this comes down is that in March, March the 2nd, 1820, Henry Clay created a conference to try and break the deadlock over the Talmadge Amendment and get the acceptance of the Thomas Amendment to admit Missouri. And he persuaded the House to vote, and they approved, Missouri's application for statehood with the Thomas Amendment attached to it. So the House passed the Senate version of the compromise with that amendment. Okay, now what happens next is that Monroe has to sign off on it. Well, now Monroe convenes his cabinet to talk about the Missouri crisis. And Monroe was very adamant that Missouri had to be on an equal footing with all the other states. And if we did something other than that, we were violating Missouri's constitutional rights. So Monroe signed the, what was then called the Missouri Bill three days later, in, uh, on the 6th of March, 1820. And Missouri thought they were a state, because now they'd been given permission to form a constitution and a state government. But it wasn't to be just yet. This actually kind of jolts Thomas Jefferson out of his complacency at Monticello. He wrote to his friend, John Holmes, in regard to the Missouri question, like a fire bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. And of course, his words proved prophetic. Clay and Jefferson are both examples of expansionists. Their notion was if slavery could expand into the territories, actually it would be more appropriate to say diffused into the territories. They thought that once it became watered down that it would disappear. There would be no reason for it because you couldn't have the kind of plantation economy out west that you could in the Deep South. So that's why they thought it would eventually end slavery. They both had some moral qualms about slavery, but not enough to keep the money out of their pockets. This is a headline in the Boston Columbian Sentinel in August of 1820. In dark Missouri now with hideous yell, fierce slavery talks and slips the dogs of hell. Here ye, say, ye, ye sentence, hear this truth sublime, quoting Erasmus, he who allows oppression shares the crime. Missourians were pretty chafed at this point. Uh, they were very supportive of the slave state status. David Barton was chosen as president of the Constitutional Convention, and he offered up the first form of the Missouri Constitution, which you're going to hear about in a little bit in the fall of 1820. Elections were held, and our three representatives and senators were chosen. Uh, John Scott was our representative. Every state, regardless of their population, starts out with one representative at least. And then our two senators, uh, Senator Thomas Hart Benton and Senator David Barton. Uh, there is a little bit of controversy about them going to Congress to be seated. Missouri's Constitution had not yet been approved, and they found a problem with it eventually. So these guys show up in Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1820, expecting to take their seats in the House and Senate. And many sources will say they were not seated. That's not exactly the case. They were seated, but they were not allowed to vote. 
that didn't go down very well in the state of Missouri. Somebody jumped the gun and created this flag in 1820 before we officially entered the Union, but it is thought to indicate Missouri's uh, place in the, in the Union. As to the boot heel, we can pin it on this guy to some extent, John Hardman Walker. John Hardman Walker uh, came into the state of Missouri as a teenager, he's about 16 or 17, and he settled in the boot heel at just about the time that the New Madrid earthquake went off. And land was very inexpensive because people wanted to get the heck out of there because that scared them to death. And he bought up an awful lot of property. And so some of his property would have, it would have placed him in Arkansas if that border had not changed. And so he went to Congress and testified that he didn't want his farm split between two states. So that was the other uh, reason for the boot heel. You can see the, the uh, real foot rift or the pneumatic seismic zone up there on the map inside the circle. So that's right in the spot where he was located. I mentioned that there was a second problem. There certainly was. And it turned into what the fix turned into the Eaton Proviso. There was a consensus that in Congress, the only people who could speak well were Southerners. So they got this guy, Thomas Eaton of Tennessee, to put forward what came to be known as the Eaton Proviso. There was a portion of Missouri's Constitution that said there shall be uh, no persons of color, it, that's not the language that was used, but no persons of color would be allowed to migrate into the state. They didn't want uh, free persons of color coming into the state because they were afraid that might give the slaves ideas, so that's why they put it in there. Well, there's absolutely no way. The restriction is, see, this is their last hope. They don't want that in there. They don't like it, and this is their attempt to stop Missouri here. This doesn't fit with the Constitution of the United States, so here's our chance to keep them out. And Eaton stepped up and offered this attachment to Missouri's application, that nothing herein contained shall be so construed as to give the assent of Congress to any provision in the Constitution of Missouri, in any, if any such there be, with, con, with which contravenes Article 4, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. In other words, you can't violate the U.S. Constitution with your state constitution. That won't be allowed. Okay, fine, he puts that forward. Is the House gonna vote on it? It sat right there on Henry Clay's desk. And there was other business for the House to take up that day. And so Clay very cleverly put that aside and began to offer up other pieces of legislation. And then when nobody was paying attention, he signed it and took it, had an aide take it to the Senate. And the Senate thought it had been passed. And so they passed it. So. Missouri was going to have to fix that part of their constitution. And Clay told the leadership of Missouri, you boys are going to have to take that part out. And, they, and then what happened next is even more ridiculous. The first meeting place of the General Assembly was in the city of St. Louis. This was the hotel where they first convened. And one of their first things th that they did in June of 1821 was create the Solemn Public Act. And the Solemn Public Act is essentially the General Assembly saying, cross our hearts, hope to die, we will never do anything with our that part of our Constitution which forbids free persons of color migrating into the state. And then they turned right around and passed a resolution. Now, resolutions aren't binding like law, but they passed a resolution. Of course, that eventually had to be set aside. But that's a pretty flimsy promise on which to put their statehood, but that's how it worked out. No one challenged Clay. So Monroe, I think, breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, finally, after all these attempts, Missouri was recognized as a state on August the 10th, 1821, which is the date of our bicentennial. There's one last little piece to this crazy story, and that is, um, this guy, whom you've probably never heard of, Felix Walker from uh, Buncombe County, North Carolina. And he stood up in Congress and was rather put out with the whole business of not being able to address the injustices that Missouri was suffering. 
and he said his constituency back home expected him to make a speech about the Missouri Compromise and to decry how Missouri was being treated. And he never did get to make his speech. So we get the term uh, bunkum or bunk as, you know, drivel that doesn't amount to anything, incorrect information or false information from Buncombe County. So it added to our lexicon just a bit. So thank you. I'm going to pick up where Deb left off, uh, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Crank Lewis. Uh, my name is Gary McKitty. I'm history faculty, uh, also past president of St. Charles County Historical Society, board member for the Missouri uh, Council for History Education, and past president and uh, representative uh, from Mochi uh, to the State Bicentennial Alliance that was formed to celebrate the bicentennial. So I'm going to pick up about 20 years later. Uh, 10 to 20 years later, uh, after uh, Missouri has become a state, and talk about a group that came in that influenced our history and culture up until today. In fact, uh, in the uh, 2010 census, 46% of Americans claimed that they had some German ancestry. Back in 2010, the St. Charles County Historical Society got a call from this guy, Peter Roloff. He's a documentary filmmaker in Berlin, Germany. And he said, we're making a documentary on the Gießen Immigration Society and why these people left Germany in the 1830s and ended up coming to Missouri. Is there anything in Missouri that shows that they made any impact on the history of the state? <laughs> Uh, well, immediately we jumped on it and said, we've got lots of things we can show you about these Germans who came in the 1830s and 1840s and how they integrated into our society. It ended up with three documentaries, uh, a book, uh, a series of novels that have just been translated into English uh, about this group of almost 600 that came to St. Charles and settled in the Augusta Dutso Defiance area in the southern part of the county. And finally, a display that was in the Missouri History Museum in Forest Park for almost nine months. So I helped uh, get Peter uh, around the county, uh, get some film for his documentary to take back, uh, never expecting that uh, after the exhibit had closed, a few years later I would be working with the Bicentennial Alliance and sort of get pegged as the German guy. Uh, a name like McKitty, right, that's Scots. Uh, but my wife's family was uh, of, of German ancestry. So in 2018, the state decided that we needed to start planning activities for this Bicentennial that was coming up in 2021. And so a meeting was held, an official document was signed. Uh, Fran Levine, uh, uh, Gary Kramer, the head of the State Historical Society, the head of the Kinder Institute, the head of the Missouri uh, Humanities Council, and that guy there in the blue tie on the left, the second one over, I don't know who he is. He just sort of slipped in. Uh, but they started sponsoring activities around the state. And the idea was to get each community to look at the ethnic groups that had founded the state, what cultural organizations were started, how did they, in fact, influence the, the various towns and organizations across Missouri? And they started with Louisiana, Missouri, because, in fact, 2018 was their 200th anniversary, their bicentennial of the founding uh, of that town. And a new book came out uh, with some nice photos of Louisiana. Uh, one of the things that was sponsored uh, by the Bicentennial Alliance was a, a series of curriculums. Uh, the Missouri Council for History Education has one available uh, called Four Years to Statehood that deals with the period eight, 1818 through 1821 uh, through the eyes of, of a 12-year-old person who was alive in Missouri at that time. Uh, a Native American girl, uh, a French ancestor of uh, former Missouri uh, Senator Kit Bond, uh, a black family, 
uh, up in uh, Pike County, uh, Missouri, and then the daughter of uh, Rufus Easton, uh, who was part of the first state government uh, in uh, St. Louis. In this year, this summer, uh, in August, uh, August 7th, uh, the city of St. Charles uh, sponsored a bicentennial bash. They divided uh, Frontier Park into decades and uh, tried to get exhibitors and groups to talk about what happened during that time period. This is the German booth in the 1830s. So why Germans, why 1830, why immigration to Missouri? And why did the population of Germans suddenly swell? Well, you'll notice here that uh, in this period from 1830 to 1850, about 120,000 Germans migrated to Missouri or to the U.S. 40,000 of them ended up in St. Louis. Uh, we only had 18 German families in 1833 on the uh, city rolls, but by the time we get to 1840, we got 6,000 Germans, and by the time we get to 1880, over 40% of the students in St. Louis public schools are German, 20,000 that speak German only. So suddenly we're going from a small group that had come in uh, to uh, this area, you'll uh, notice the, the dark areas in there. Uh, we have what's called the German Triangle, and uh, that includes uh, Cincinnati, uh, Milwaukee, and St. Louis. And those were sort of the jumping off points from which these immigrants came. There had been a few Germans here uh, earlier in the uh, 1790s. Uh, Daniel Boone brought the members of the Van Bieber family. They had come from Western Germany uh, in the uh, 1683 uh, to uh, establish a little town in Pennsylvania, which they appropriately named Germantown. Uh, Daniel Boone's two sons, Nathan Boone and Daniel Morgan Boone, both married into this German family. Uh, this is Olive uh, Van, uh, Van Bieber Boone and her husband, Nathan Boone. If you go across Missouri, you will find one of those uh, things that definitely answered Peter's questions. Is there anything German? Uh, we have New Melly, we have Kaplan, we have Westphalia, uh, a number of towns across the state. Uh, Dutzel, of course, Herman, uh, Rhineland. I mean, come on, how much more German can you get than that? Uh, Potsdam, uh, later it named Potsdam Pershing during World War I, they amended the name. But why come out of Germany at that time? Well, in the 1830s, 1832, and again in 1848, there was a series of student-led revolutions in Germany, attempting to get the nobles to set up parliaments. They all failed. And so many people felt that it was no longer safe to stay in Germany if they had been part of uh, these uh, failed revolutions. Uh, also, in Germany, one uh, could get drafted. Uh, we have the uh, Hessians, uh, Hessians that came over. Uh, those men were drafted in Germany and then were rented to the King of England to come and fight against the American colonies. The inheritance laws were also very specific in Germany. Uh, one, uh, the farm went to the oldest son, period. Or the oldest daughter, if she got married, if there was only daughters, it went to the oldest girl. When she got married, it went to her husband. And so let's look for somewhere else to go. Let's look for a place where we don't have to get a permit for our job, where we don't have to get a permit to move from town to town. And they were attracted to Missouri by a small book that had been published by Mr. Duden in 1829. He had come over in 1824, lived for five years uh, outside of Dutzo in southern St. Charles County, and went back to Germany, wrote a small book that became extremely popular, became a bestseller for people who wanted to immigrate. And he said, Missouri has beautiful hillsides where you can grow grapes, and you have the bottomland along the river, and the winters are never very cold, and the summers are never very hot. Well, they weren't during the years he was here. However, within five years, when we've got these 40,000 Germans coming in, 
we're back to Missouri summers of over 100 degrees and winters that are sub-zero. And there are lots of letters in German newspapers, particularly around Gießen, uh, which is in uh, southwestern Germany, saying, Duden lied. He lied to us. But you know, we get to vote and we get to own our own property and we can sell it and leave it to whom we want. And the, we don't have to be the religion of the, the governor of the state. We can join whatever religion we want. The largest group to come in St. Charles, and this was the one that Peter Roloff was uh, investigating, uh, was led by two men, Friedrich Munch, uh, there are still Munch descendants here, and his brother-in-law, Paul Felinius. And they came over on two ships. Uh, one ended up coming through New Orleans and the other that came in through the East Coast and brought a large group of Lutherans into Missouri. The idea was to establish a, a state within a state. There were gonna be areas that only spoke German. Uh, they had German-speaking schools, they had German-speaking churches, of course, uh, producing wine and beer, the two favorite drinks of the Germans. Uh, they were also very heavily involved in sports, the Turnverein's. These were societies that had started in Germany at the universities to train young men in sports, but also to convince them to become revolutionaries. And so the idea of coming over and establishing these sports activities in uh, Missouri kept them physically fit. Now, many of these people who came listed themselves as farmers because that was the easiest way to get past uh, American immigration. Uh, it was to claim that you came in, but even when Duden came, he claimed he was a farmer. Well, he did buy farmland, but he also brought a cook, a housekeeper, and a professional farmer to do the work. Uh, and so many of these Germans became known as Latin farmers because they spent more time reading in Latin and Greek and German than they did actually working on some of their farms. They also established the Lutheran Church in the United States. So if you're a member of uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, that started with the, the establishment of Concordia Seminary in the 1830s, now located in Clayton. So we had musical groups, we had schools, uh, St. Charles German Catholic Benevolent Society, uh, and these Latin farmers uh, continued their traditions. Unfortunately, they, they never were successful at establishing a German state within Missouri, but when the Civil War rolled around, having come from a land where they were extremely restricted, most of them became abolitionists. And Frederick Munch uh, became a state senator. Uh, he became a speaker and an abolitionist writer for Anzeig des Westens, the largest German newspaper that circulated in the Midwest. And there was a close collaboration between many of these freed blacks like John Meacham in St. Louis, who in fact was an African-American who uh, established one of the first schools for African-Americans in the state and the German newspaper editors and the German writers in the German press. The beginning of the Civil War in Missouri started with a bloody confrontation uh, near what today is St. Louis University called Camp Jackson. Claiborne Jackson, the governor of the state, had called men to come and train to serve for the South. Well, the general at uh, Jefferson Barracks, Nathaniel Lyon, was not particularly happy to have a training ground in St. Louis for people who were going to join the Confederate Army. And so he started marching north. Uh, to uh, disperse these people, take the leaders prisoner. As he marched, many of the German farmers joined so that by the time he reached St. Louis, it's estimated that about 50% of the troops were non-regulars and they were German. In Missouri, uh, we had a, a number of uh, local commanders uh, throughout the Midwest, many of the Germans went uh, to serve under Franz Siegel. He had been a leader in the revolution in 1848 in Germany, come to Missouri, uh, joined the, the U.S. military. Uh, they even had their own uh, theme song, Ich gehe zu Schlag mit Siegel, 
I go to fight with Siegel. Locally in St. Charles County, we had a prominent uh, lawyer uh, who had come in the 1830s named Arnold Crackle. And he and his brother Nicholas had come as teenagers. He had attended St. Charles College and gotten his law degree, set up a law practice and a German newspaper in St. Charles. And when the war began, uh, he was in the process of negotiating with the North Missouri Railroad. He and Nicholas had bought some property west of St. Charles, which he thought was a good distance from St. Charles so that the trains would need to stop and pick up fuel and water. And they said, if you will put a train station across the street from our house, we'll guarantee to build a town and name it after the president of the railroad, John O'Fallon. And so the Crackle brothers founded O'Fallon. Crackle also helped organize the German farmers and the abolitionists in St. Charles County into units. He was given the rank of colonel, and uh, they took it upon themselves to guard the railroad bridges and the river crossings between St. Louis County and St. Charles. This is the blockhouse that was built at Peru Creek. It's just north of Highway 70 at Lake St. Louis. And when the men weren't out on patrol, uh, they were training in an apple grove uh, on uh, Randolph Street in St. Charles, uh, where Benton, the old Benton School Building is now. It's now the headquarters for the St. Charles City School District. At the end of the war, Crackle was involved in the Constitutional Convention to rewrite what would be the Constitution of Missouri and also was appointed a federal judge. It was the last federal judgeship appointed by Abraham Lincoln uh, before Lincoln left for the theater that day. He sent it off uh, to be registered that Crackle would become a federal judge. As part of the Constitutional Convention, they decided that slavery would now, in January of 1865, be outlawed in the state of Missouri. The 13th Amendment doesn't go into effect in the uh, federal level outlawing slavery in the other states until December. So when it comes time to sign our Emancipation Proclamation, of course, Arnold Crackle, who's up in the upper left-hand corner, who's chairman of the Constitutional Convention, is the first man to sign it. After the war, uh, he uh, had moved to uh, Jefferson City, where he was serving his judgeship. And he worked with a series of US colored troops to establish a law school at a university that was being founded for African Americans in Missouri called Lincoln University, which is still there today. He's buried in Oak Grove Cemetery here in St. Charles. After the war, uh, German businesses boomed with the new railroads and the bridges that had crossed the, the Mississippi River and the railroads that crossed the river of Missouri up at Kansas City. And many of the German communities began holding festivals again and celebrating their Germanness. Malincrot Chemical became one of the largest uh, chemical companies in the country and also one of the largest pharmaceutical firms. Uh, the Missouri wineries propelled us to be the third largest wine producing area of the United States. Uh, in the 1870s and 80s. Of course, Anheuser-Busch uh, be, quickly becomes the largest brewery in the US. At one point, they're turning out 500,000 barrels of beer every year that's being shipped across the United States. One young lady, we can't forget the ladies, do not forget the ladies, as Abigail Adams reminds us, uh, Susan Blow from a very prominent family uh, her family, in fact, at one point had owned Dred Scott, uh, the slave that had sued for his freedom. Uh, Susan went to Europe in the 1870s to observe education, and she noticed that they were starting to educate their children at about three years old in some of the German schools. She comes back to St. Louis, writes a curriculum, goes to the school board, and establishes the first public school kindergarten in the United States. So that was part of the German influence right here. During this time period, 
Uh, many Germans were continuing to come over in South St. Louis. Uh, there became the Dutch town neighborhood. Of course, they weren't Dutch, they were Deutsch. Uh, they built uh, right off of uh, Jefferson Avenue, the German house where immigrants could stay and be trained in English uh, and job skills. Uh, they would be trained there. Although many of the Germans already came with skills, in fact, the Missouri State Capitol was built mostly by German immigrant stonemasons who came over. So during World War I and World War II, of course, the Germanness of Missouri uh, was tamped down because of the anti-German feeling during the war. But uh, the German uh, farmers increased their production, and many of the German churches uh, St. Charles had a French Catholic Church, Barmeo, and then St. Peter's, which was the German Catholic Church, uh, switched over to English. Uh, one unfortunate thing in our history in St. Charles County is that uh, during World War II, they discontinued the German classes and took all the textbooks on the front lawn of the school and held a bonfire. Uh, yes, St. Charles County. Uh, but after the war, the German uh, immigration continued, particularly many of what were called Donau Schwaben. They were Germans whose families in the 15 and 1600s had moved into the Austro-Hungarian Empire and were now fleeing Romania and Hungary and countries that were being taken over by the communists. They moved into South St. Louis. So when Peter Olaf called from Berlin and said, is there anything German? He said, well, we've got the fact that the Germans kept us in the Union during the Civil War. We've got the fact that you can come to St. Charles, which you can do later this month, and go to Oktoberfest. And anybody been to Oktoberfest? <laughs> Need to go to the Oktoberfest in St. Charles. There are over 20 different German uh, cultural organizations operating in the St. Louis area today. And most of them are under the auspices of the German American Committee that operates out of the German Hall in South St. Louis. So you can go to programs at the Missouri History Museum about uh, German history. This was on uh, German traditional Trachten, traditional clothing. You can hear the men's choir sing in German. You can hear the women's choir sing in German. You can celebrate German American Day, which was proclaimed by Ronald Reagan to be October the 6th. Hopefully uh, next year there will be a celebration at the German Hall in South St. Louis. Again, this year it's going to be virtual, again, because of the COVID. Uh, St. Louis has a sister city of Stuttgart uh, in uh, Germany. St. Charles has its sister city, which is about 15 miles north of Stuttgart uh, in the town of Ludwigsburg. Ludwigsburg. Ludwigsburg is known for its medieval architecture and also the fact that it has the largest Baroque palace uh, in all of Germany. Uh, this small little house here has 408 rooms. Uh, on the property, there are also two other small palaces because the Grand Duchess wouldn't let the Grand Duke keep his mistresses in the main house. They had to be across at the other end of the property. German beer is still popular across Missouri. Many of the small craft breweries uh, will uh, use the German formula uh, for uh, pure, natural spring water, uh, hops, wheat, a little malt, some sugar, and yeast. It's got to be all natural. Uh, the Missouri German Consortium is an online organization that keeps track of what's going on. For example, Deutsch Country Days, sponsored by the Missouri Parks Department at the Lupton House Farm uh, in Marthasville each year, uh, where you can learn about German crafts and the German settlers who came in in this 1830 to 1840 period. The German school in South St. Louis. You can go over to Belleville to Hofbräu House, have a German meal and hear German music. Uh, das Bevo has just reopened. It used to be Bevo Mill, belonged to the Anheuser, built by the Anheuser Busch family. Uh, they've opened for brunch uh, on the weekends. Uh, the Humanities Council sponsored a German heritage corridor identifying German historic sites across the state and there will be an interactive map online. So did they in fact have an impact on Missouri? Most certainly, uh, and particularly an abolitionist impact uh, in working with the African Americans. So if you're still interested in bicentennial activities,
Uh, you can go to Missouri2021.org and it will tell you what is coming up within the next months. There are some things planned out even, I think the last I saw was in March of next year, uh, was a festival that has been uh, officially recognized as one of the bicentennial activities. And whether or not you know you are part of the bicentennial, if you got a license plate in the last few years, you're promoting Missouri's bicentennial, 1821 to 2021. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gabriel Harper. I'm a political science professor here at St. Charles Community College. And I was going to discuss the Missouri Constitution, some of the interesting things that are in it and how it's changed over time. And then I wanted to briefly discuss how it's working today and how our current state and government operates. So we were talking about how Missouri came into existence as a state in 1821. And unlike the US Constitution, people don't have nearly as much reverence or sense of permanence with their state constitutions. If you, held a, if you had an idea today that we need to hold a new constitutional convention and just rewrite the entire United States Constitution, you get a lot of pushback on that. People hold the US Constitution in almost a religious sense of reverence, that's how I often describe it, and people don't feel that way about their state constitutions. So we've had four different constitutions over our history as a state, whereas we're still running on the US Constitution, which was enacted in 1789. The current constitution we have here in Missouri was written in 1942, although it was not officially adopted until 1945. It's gone through a lot of changes in that period. And the Missouri Constitution, like most other state constitutions in the US, is closely based on the US Constitution. You see a lot of the same structures there. You've got an executive branch at the federal level, of course, that's the president. At the state level, that's the governor. The governor heads the executive branch of the state of Missouri. Uh, you have the legislative branch of government. In the federal level, of course, that's Congress. Uh, here in Missouri, we have our General Assembly, commonly referred to as the state legislature. And it's comprised of a state house of representatives and state senate just like at the federal level. We also have a state Supreme Court that holds court in Jefferson City across from the state capitol building, just like they have a Supreme Court building in Washington, DC. There are some interesting differences in how the judicial branch works here in Missouri, particularly in the way that judges are picked to work in it. Uh, Gary mentioned that one of the last acts of President Lincoln was to name a federal judge. If there's a vacancy on a federal court position, be it in the Supreme Court of the United States, one of our courts of 13 courts of appeals in the US or one of our 92 federal district courts, if there's a vacancy in any of those positions, the president gets to name the new judge and that judge has to be confirmed by a vote in the US Senate. Here in Missouri, when the state first came into existence, all judges from the state Supreme Court all the way down to your local circuit court judges were elected through a democratic vote. And that seemed to work okay at first, but you always had problems with political corruption and this really came to a head in the 19, 1930s, early 1940s in the city of Kansas City, Missouri. There's a guy, Tom Pendergast, a few of you may have heard his name before, know of him. Tom Pendergast was the big mob boss in Kansas City at that time. He was tight with uh, uh, Harry S. Truman um, and helped Truman start his political career. And Pendergast had a couple of lawyers working for him, and he had such a stranglehold on the local Democratic Party that when some judge positions came open and there was an election coming up, he ran his own lawyers for these judge positions. And they won, not surprisingly, because just like today, Kansas City was strongly Democratic at the time. So now you have a couple of Tom Pendergast's own lawyers working as judges in Kansas City. That's convenient when your gangsters get arrested and get brought into court because you've got your own lawyers, people who are former lawyers of Tom Pendergast are judges in the case. And they would often dismiss charges against these gangsters. As a result of all this corruption in the Kansas City area and in other parts of the state as well, there was a, um, a voter referendum was held in 1940. And we changed the way that we elected our high-ranking judges at this point. Uh, this was called later on the Missouri Plan. And with this plan, it, ap it applies to people who are named to our state Supreme Court in Jefferson City, our three appeals courts. We have three state courts of appeals here in Missouri, one in St. Louis, one in Kansas City, one in Springfield. And it also applies to any circuit court or associate circuit court positions in St. Louis City, St. Louis County, Greene County, which is where Springfield, Missouri is, and uh, the two counties that Kansas City sort of covers. All of those are covered under the Missouri plan. If any judicial office is open in any of those areas, 
they form a nonpartisan commission. The nonpartisan commission is made up of three people named by the governor. The governor normally names people from the state prosecutor's office for this. Three people are named by the state bar association, so these are normally prominent lawyers in the state of Missouri. And the seventh person on the commission will be the current chief justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. When this happens, when they have an opening on one of these courts, they put out a, a call and they uh, have people send in applications. And this is a lot like a regular job interview process. They have people come in, people drive into Jefferson City, uh, they have an interview there, just as like if you were applying for a regular job. And the committee will come up with three names, three people they think are qualified to hold this position. They forward those names to the governor, and the governor has the option to pick one of them. And this system has worked so well in Missouri at reducing corruption and also reducing partisan influence on the process. The idea here is you're supposed to be naming judges here in Missouri based on their qualifications, not on their political connections or their own political ideology. And this system works so well that almost half of, I think, 23 other states in the U.S. right now have adopted what's called the Missouri Plan into their own constitutions. So that's one thing I think you can really see is notable in the Missouri Constitution. It's worked very well in our state. And a lot of other states have copied this method of selecting high-ranking judges into their own state constitutions. The state of Missouri's constitution is also significantly more democratic than the United States Constitution is. If we make changes to federal law or to the US Constitution, only Congress can start that process. Uh, in the case of a bill being proposed, the president would have to sign it. Uh, in the case of a constitutional amendment, the states would have to ratify any change to the U.S. Constitution. Here in Missouri, if we want to make alterations to our Constitution, there's two ways to do it. One, you can have the state legislature pass a bill calling for a change to our state Constitution, and then it's put to a vote of the people. No change to our state Constitution can occur without the approval of our voters. So if the state legislature passes a proposed amendment, goes out to the voters, if even 50.0001% vote to approve it, we've changed our state constitution. Even more interestingly, you can do what's called a voter initiative. And this is where uh, groups of citizens or special interest groups go out and collect signatures on a petition. They can put a, uh, an issue directly on the ballot and let the voters di directly approve it, cutting the state government, I mean the state legislature, the governor, completely out of this process. And this has been very useful for liberal groups here in Missouri because recently the Missouri government has been controlled pretty strongly by the Republican Party. So more progressive organizations in the state have used this voter initiative process to do things like raise our state minimum wage, legalize medical marijuana, and uh, recently to expand Medicaid, which we had a panel discussion on just this last Tuesday. The Missouri Constitution is also a bit more democratic in that we don't have an electoral college. At the federal level, of course, the president and the vice president are ultimately chosen by the electoral college. Here in Missouri, it's a direct vote of the people. Now, as I just mentioned, right now here in the state of Missouri, we have effective one-party domination of the government. There's only one person who holds statewide office right now who's not a Republican. That's Nicole Galloway, our current state auditor. She's a Democrat. All other state offices that are elected by the people or appointed by the governor are all currently held by Republicans. Republicans hold very strong majorities in both houses of our Missouri state legislature, our General Assembly here. And because of this, it's an interesting thing to look at in that when you look at the federal government, a lot of people complain nothing ever gets done. President Joe Biden is currently being kind of stymied by the Republicans in Congress and to a certain extent by members of his own party in trying to get his uh, bills passed and uh, getting even his, um, his budget passed right now. In Missouri, the governor doesn't have that kind of problem. They don't have as much of a problem passing bills because we have effective one-party control. The Republican Party controls approximately 75% of the seats in our Missouri House of Representatives and Missouri Senate. Now, whether or not you think this is a good thing is kind of your point of view. Obviously, liberals don't like this, progressives don't like this in the state of Missouri because they can't get any kind of bills passed. And the Missouri state government keeps passing more and more conservative legislation. Their only real option to change Missouri law is through the voter initiative process that we just talked about a minute ago here. But in some ways, this is very efficient. The Republican Party in Missouri is very good at passing bills and passing their budget every year. They don't have the gridlock that we have at the federal level, so maybe that's worth noting. Um, and there are, of course, other states in the union, like California, where the Democrats hold effective one-party control of those states. So you can see that as being kind of an interesting way that our state government works when you compare it to the federal government of the United States. As a result of progressive organizations using 
this ballot process to pass bills, pass laws, and make changes to our state constitution that the Republican-controlled state legislature would never agree to, things like I mentioned earlier, raising the minimum wage or expanding Medicaid. As a result of that, you've seen a push in the state legislature among some Republicans to really make it more difficult to enact these voter initiatives that I talked about earlier. I've heard some proposals that said, from now on, we want to really increase the number of signatures uh, you have to get on the petition to put uh, an issue on the ballot. Or we should raise the threshold for passing a constitutional amendment. Right now, as I mentioned earlier, if even 50.00.1% of the um, population agree to a change to our state constitution, it's put into effect. Uh, some proposals in our Missouri legislature have called to raising that to perhaps 67% of the vote more than two-thirds, which would make it much more difficult to get voter approval for any change to our state laws or state constitutions. Um, I was talking with Trish Gunby, a state representative, uh, on Tuesday morning we were discussing Medicaid expansion in Missouri, and she talked to uh, the audience about how Republicans in the state legislature held off on that legislation this year, but in this coming session, this next year, you can expect those bills to differently come back because the Republican Party of Missouri really likes having this level of domination over our state government and would like to make it more difficult to alter our state laws or state constitution by uh, these voter initiative processes. Thank you. Right. Questions? No? All right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, August 7th was the main celebration in St. Charles, and then August 10th, the actual day. But if you'll go to uh, Missouri2021.org, O-R-G, there's a list of or celebrations across the state, uh, from uh, an Ozark music festival that's going to be down in Cape Girardeau uh, to a, a classic car manufacturing. I can't re remember which town it was, a town that, that was involved in auto parts manufacturing. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of things where you could get involved and go and spend a day and, and celebrate. Uh, also, uh, there are exhibits that are touring the state. Uh, we put together a bicentennial quilt uh, that's, that's coming around the state. There's also one on uh, called My Missouri. It's photos of Missouri during the four seasons of the year. Uh, if also on uh, Missouri2021.org, there's an online encyclopedia to which you can contribute. Uh, there's a, a photo exhibit of about 200 photos that were taken. Uh, in the last four years across the state of Missouri. So they're all available online, and that's sponsored by the State Historical Society in Columbia. So there are some things where you can get involved. Thanks for the question. Yes? Yeah. I'm intrigued by the last bit um, that you offered, Dave, um, about the Republican initiative to make it harder and more expensive to Mm -hmm. I could look this up, but I want to just ask, what's the argument? In, in, how do they defend that? Because to me, right. it's a court, and it discourages democratic action, it discourages yeah. citizen you know, engagement. Well, clearly it's a limitation on democracy in that respect. As I mentioned, Missouri has a state constitution that's much more democratic than the U.S. Constitution is and allows more direct input from citizens on how their government operates. When you're a politician and you make these kind of arguments, you've got to be kind of careful how you say them because you don't want to come across as you're trying to disempower the people. I heard some Republicans on the floor of the Missouri Senate or Missouri House actually saying things like, and there is some validity to these arguments, that our nation was founded as a democratic republic, not as a direct democracy. That is, Americans are supposed to elect their own political leadership, and then that political leadership makes the decisions. Now, most of the politicians making those kind of statements are in extremely safe Republican districts, where they don't have to worry about that a backlash from the voter from making those kind of statements. 
But um, those are the kind of arguments you usually hear for that. You'll also hear things like, and there's some truth to these arguments, that these initiatives are sometimes backed by wealthy out-of-state nonprofits or individuals. Um, the failed move to try to change how we draw our political districts here in Missouri was funded by a wealthy couple from Texas who are trying to change the way gerrymandering works in the United States. But those are the kind of arguments you usually hear that the average person really isn't as qualified as elected political leaders to judge complex political issues. Um, and that you may have a disproportionate influence coming in from out of state. These are the famous outside agitator thing, right? There are outside agitators who are, you know, bringing on these ballot initiatives and they don't really originate with the people. Those are the ones I've heard the most. Anybody else have anything while we're up here? How's your day? My day's been great. So, how about yours? Ups and downs. <laughs> Ups and downs? All right. Yes. Yeah, Michael. I've just uh, obtained this is just Missouri only, but uh, there's uh, the University of Missouri professor Brooks Blevins, who's done a series of books, a history of the Ozarks, and I read uh, volume one, and I just looked into volume two, which goes up to about I think, 1900. I just wanted to mention it uh, because it's absolutely fascinating, and I was very impressed with his capability to use documentary history and relate it in the intelligence. I'm from the Ozarks. I should read those. And Ozarks history, I find it very interesting. I've read quite a lot about it in the past. What part of the Ozarks? Springfield. Okay. So, the Queen City. Yeah. <laughs> I'd also like to recommend Walter Johnson's book, The Broken Heart of America, Race Relations in St. Louis. It's an excellent history of from the beginning of the city uh, up until the Cookie Thornton shooting uh, in Kirkwood. Uh, so it's a... Uh, so we are, are getting some good uh, scholarship on Missouri history and putting it into uh, national perspective, which is great. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, please uh, go on the uh, Missouri2021.org website and look and see what you can do to be, con continue to be part of this bicentennial that runs through the rest of the year and uh, spills over a little bit into next year. <laughs> but uh, we have some things of which we can be proud and uh, some things of which we have to be contentious and uh, say that's the history. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nick.